much and welcome to the Elmwood Senior Center. Thank you everybody for joining us today. It's um, Brookdale West Hartford's pleasure to be here with you. And we thank Elmwood Senior Center for graciously allowing us to uh, join you today for this wonderful event. Um, I'd also like to introduce my partner in crime, Steve Manileo, who is our business development manager. He's going to say a few words about Brookdale. Well, we're very proud to be here and uh, hope you guys enjoy the food. Brookdale is the largest senior living center pretty much across America. And uh, we have almost 2,000 locations that we are representing West Hartford. And really just are very proud to be here. I want to introduce our chef, James, who will be preparing the food, cooked it all, brought it out for you. And really, we just hope you enjoy it. So he's a wonderful program ahead, and we're excited to watch him here. So thank everybody, and thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> I should also thank uh, Melvin for coming along to help with the food service, and again, I know this is going to be a spectacular lunch. Oh, look, best over there. <laughs> um, and also to our staff who have worked diligently for weeks on this program, I just want to give you a very brief background. Our uh, staff member, Angela Shank, who is the Elmwood Express trip coordinator, originally brought this idea our way. This is not a program that she would typically do because she's normally planning the bus trips within the state. Angela, we want to thank you for this whole idea and getting the ball rolling. Angela's daughter is a performer in the program today. We'll tell you a little bit more about that after, but thank you to Lisa Hamps, program coordinator, and Liz Forrest, our marketing guru, and for uh, West Hartford Community Television being here. Sarah, thank you for documenting this so that the rest of the community can enjoy it after the event. At this point, we'd like to invite you to take your plate, table number one, and proceed up to this delicious luncheon that's been lovingly prepared for you all. Enjoy the day. Thank you again. I've been told that it's okay if you so wish to get up quietly and um, get a little bit of extra of any particular item. We really do need to keep with our schedule today. I just learned, and I'm just absolutely flabbergasted by this, that the uh, dance troupe has come to us, Hartford, from New York City just today, and that's why we need to keep on a schedule because they need to return by bus to New York City. So they've come here just for this Elmwood Senior Center program. It's just, it's just amazing to me. So this is a very special story that only the person involved in the program can really share uh, the details, and it's truly from his heart. Ramon Baca is the creative director of West Hartford's uh, Ballet Theater Company, and he's an Iraq a war veteran. And what he has done through the course of this program in dance is to help himself transition from the effects of war and re-entering re civilian life. His story can only be told by him, and I would really warmly welcome you to the stage. Thank you so much, Ramon, for coming from New York with your fabulous group of dancers. We can't wait to see them perform, and I'm very interested in hearing your story, as are our guests. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, before I begin, I just want to uh, lay the groundwork. Please don't feel shy about continuing your meal and or getting up to get more. It looks amazing. Um, one thing I'd like to do before we start is, can we just give a big round of applause to all the veterans in the audience? While I've been working in West Hartford, I've had the opportunity to work with the American Legion down on Raymond Road. And I can tell you that the gentlemen that not only are a part of that organization, but that run and help that organization um, are very valuable to this community. And uh, we have two of those gentlemen here today. Please give them a round of applause while they're working on the project. So um, the way this is going to work is uh, once we begin the show, and the show hasn't started yet, um, 
I'm going to take you on a journey of not only my story, but tell that story a little bit through some pieces that we've created in the dance world. So um, I hope you enjoy. And then afterwards, uh, we're going to have a question and answer session. And usually those question and answer sessions are where you're asking questions about the uh, the work, about the experience. But I also would like, there's a couple of pieces that you'll see that are brand new to the program. And if you have comments or feedback on those pieces, I'd be really interested to hear it. Um, this performance, part of this performance was made possible by the Greater Harper Arts Council and through a grant uh, funded by United Healthcare. So um, that's very important to us to give them feedback about today's performance. That reminds me, one last note. The audio for this performance, it's going to be a little touch and go because of the way the audio set up is. So if it gets loud, I will do my best to turn it down as soon as possible. Um, but just be prepared. It was January 2000. I was standing on the parade deck, Paris Island, South Carolina. I had traveled from my home in Connecticut to become a United States Marine. I spent three months in Paris Island learning all of the things that the Marines teach you in order to earn the title, learning how to make your bed, learning how to shine your boots, learning how to fight, learning how to use a weapon. At the end of those three months of training, each Marine is allowed to invite their loved ones onto the base to show them the things that they have accomplished and to let them witness their graduation into the ranks of the United States Marine Corps. It was the day before graduation, and I had invited my girlfriend who I was dating. And she brought a yellow vanilla envelope full of photos. I took those photos. I marched straight up to my senior drill instructor, snapped to attention and said, senior drill instructor, this Marine would like to speak to you, sir. He was a short man. He had these beady eyes and braces. So every time he yelled at you, he spit. He looked down at me and he sneered. Whoa. This Marine would like to show you something, sir. And I handed him the yellow manila envelope full of photos. He pulled out the largest one. It was a photo of me in tights and a tunic, partnering a beautiful ballerina in a tattoo. We were, we were actually dancing Sleeping Beauty not far from here. Um, and it was a photo shoot for that performance. He took one look at the photo, started to shake his head, and said, Oh, Baka. Baka, I knew there was something weird about you. <laughs> you see, I was a classical ballet dancer before I joined the United States Marine Corps. I trained at the Nutmeg Conservatory for the Arts, which is in Torrington, Connecticut. After graduating from the Nutmeg Conservatory for the Arts, I started performing in ballets like you'll see today, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty. And so to begin the performance, what we'd like to do for you is to show you a little bit of the classical ballet influence. And I'll tell you a little bit about more of the pieces once those are completed. Joining us today are students from Ballet Theatre Company, which is not far from here, that uh, I am the artistic director of, and professionals from Exit 12 Dance Company in New York City. So I hope you enjoyed the ballet section of the performance.
to dance the pas de deux. It's called the white pas de deux. And it's two skaters dancing together. One of the most dramatic parts of the pas de deux was there was a lift where the lady would get in front of you. You'd have to put your arm around her waist like this and hold her arm. And then you would do this. And if you can use your imagination, the lady's legs would go upside down and split. And so both of us would be upside down. And then I'd have to put her back down and do it again. And then I'd have to put her back down again and do it a third time. I was dancing with a, a lovely young lady from Washington, Connecticut. And we were rehearsing this piece for almost two months. And then we had the opportunity to perform it at a performance, a professional performance. And it took her two months to say, can you not hold me so tightly? I have bruises from here to here. Because I didn't want her to fall. But I have bruises from here to here. And, and it's really hard to put my pants on in the morning because it hurts so much. <laughs> So the next piece you're going to see is an excerpt from Liv Hattoners. Thank you. 
I went from the Nutmeg Conservatory for the Arts, from learning classical ballet and dancing these wonderful productions, to in January of 2000, stepping on the yellow footprints of Paris Island, South Carolina, to join the United States Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps for a couple of reasons. I joined the Marine Corps because I wanted to help fight for people that couldn't fight for themselves. I wanted to do good things in the world, and I wanted to serve my country. I graduated from the Marine Corps, and I became what's known as a tow anti-tank missile assaultman. That's a big, long word, which means we were tasked with firing missiles that could destroy tanks. In 2005, my unit that was comprised of men from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Ohio, and California were all deployed to Fallujah, Iraq, one of the most dangerous places in Iraq at the time. We were being trained in the months leading up to flying out to Fallujah like we were going to get dropped in the middle of the Wild West and we'd have to walk around leery that we would be shot at from windows, doors, and that there would be insurgents hiding around every corner. They didn't need those missiles in Fallujah, so we were cross-trained as machine gunners. We were rolling out in Humvees with heavy machine guns that fired bullets and heavy machine guns that fired grenades. And we were looking for the bad guys. So if you can imagine a squad of about 12 to 14 Marines in three Humvees with about as much weaponry as you could fit inside a Humvee, rolling as fast as they can down the road looking for bad guys. We were violent and we were aggressive because that's what the Marine Corps taught us to do to keep people from attacking us. And it took us about five months to realize that what these villages needed wasn't aggressive, violent Marines. What they needed was help. Our NCOs and leaders above us started to transition our missions, and we started incorporating humanitarian elements. The first one of those, our platoons went out and tried to catalog all of the houses and the villages so that we would know how many people lived there, and we could know when something was going awry. When we were cataloging those houses, we went into one of the local schools. Now, if you can imagine a schoolhouse that's not bigger than, if you can imagine the foyer right there, the entrance to the auditorium, about half of that, with a chalkboard and eight desks, was their schoolhouse. We noticed that they didn't have a lot of school supplies. So what we did is we went back to base, and we went up to the chaplain, and the chaplain gave us backpacks, school supplies, soccer balls, and stuffed animals to take back to the school the next time we went out. I thought I was the only one that was getting what I wanted from the Marine Corps out of these missions. But I was happy to know that my Marines got charged up every time we were going out to interact with the locals and do good things. So we started to do more. We handed out those school supplies to the school. Every time we went out, we had food and water that we could hand out to the locals. And then right before we left, we went into the villages and interacted with all of the leaders of the villages to create a neighborhood watch type program where the villagers could tell the base if something was going wrong. I credit that work with our battalion all coming home with only two casualties. Our platoon of 60 plus Marines had zero casualties. I got back from Fallujah in 2007 and, and what I quickly realized was the war had left destruction, not only in Iraq, but my, me and my fellow veterans were coming back injured, physically and emotionally. And so what we started to do was put these works together that you're going to see of 
dance and dance performances that are talking about the military experience, talking about the effect of the wars on populations. This first piece that you're gonna see is our newest endeavor. It's called War Requiem, and I hope you don't mind if I read what I wrote about it. War Requiem that you're gonna see today is the beginning of a larger ballet that was built with inspiration, input, and feedback from veterans and victims of World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, and the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. The music for this section is the Dies Are from Benjamin Britten's War Requiem. It was written for the reconsecration of the Coventry Cathedral, which was destroyed during the Battle of Britain during World War II. The War Requiem was not meant to be a pro-British piece or a glorification of British soldiers, but a public statement of Britain's anti-war convictions. It was a de unit denunciation of the wickedness of war, not of other men. The fact that Britain wrote the piece for three specific soloists, a German, a Russian, and a Brit, demonstrated that he had more than the losses of his own country in mind, and symbolized the importance of reconciliation and a warning for future generations of the senselessness of taking up arms against fellow men. The War Requiem is dedicated to four of Britain's friends who were killed during World War I. So for the text of the War Requiem, Britain interspersed the Latin Mass for the Dead with nine poems written by Wilfred Owen, who was a World War I foot soldier who was killed a year before the armistice. Owen said about his poetry, I'm not concerned with poetry. My subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. Yet these elegies are to this generation no sen in no sense conciliatory. They may be the next. All a poet can do today is warn. That is why true poets must be truthful. Like Owen, the veterans that contributed to this work that you're going to see we're interested in communicating the devastating impacts of war, visible and invisible to viewers. The DSRA is the longest part of the War Requiem. The unusual meter that you will hear is a clever way that Britain used to prevent the tro trochaic tentrometers of the Latin text from sounding repetitive or boring. He creates the feeling of a crippled march by constantly shifting the musical accent. The veterans that contributed to this work felt that the crippled marching that you'll see near the end of the work is reminiscent of a veteran's return home and the struggle to find normalcy again. Connecticut and New York-based veterans from all eras contributed to the creation, selection of costuming, and critical review in response to War Requiem. So I present to you War Requiem, and this is one of the pieces I would like your feedback on. Thank you.
that were <coughs> devastating to me. Specifically one, um, one of my veteran fellow Marines who lives, he, he lived in Hamden. In 2011, he took the choice that so many veterans do today of, of leaving this life a bit early. I don't know if you know, but about 20 to 22 veterans a day are, are making that choice. I knew then that I had to do something different. And so I started volunteering with a veteran service organization called The Mission Continues. Our first service project was making arts and crafts kits that were in little Ziploc bags that could be taken to help kids in hospitals past the time. The Mission Continues is a great organization. They, they give fellowships to veterans to help them along a new path post-military service. And so I applied for one of those fellowships. And in 2012, I was awarded a fellowship with Battery Dance Company, which is a dance company in New York City that does cultural diplomacy overseas. Their first example of that was bringing together a group of Palestinian and Israeli students together in Germany and having them dance together. We had a lofty goal in 2012. We wanted to do two of these workshops in New York City public schools with New York City high school students. The second goal was to go back to a Iraq and do one of these programs in a Iraq. And in April 2012, we had the opportunity I went to a rock with another dancer from New York City. She was about 92 pounds, about four foot nine, and she was going to a place I had carried a rifle. She was scared, and in the car to JFK, she looks at me and she said, I've been all over the world doing these programs, and I've never been scared, and my family has never been scared for me. She said, but this time I'm scared. And I looked at her and I said, I'm a Marine. <laughs> Don't worry. If anything happens, I'll take care of it. <laughs> Total BS, right? We flew into Erbil, Iraq, and we got these Mission Impossible type instructions. We were supposed to get off the plane, run and get our bags, go from baggage claim to a bus that was going to take us to a parking lot where we were supposed to meet our interpreter. Now, the State Department hadn't given us our visas to be in the country yet. So we were landing in Iraq without visas even to be in the country. So we did it. We ran straight from the plane. It was about 4 a.m. Iraqi time. We ran straight from the plane to the baggage claim, like good New Yorkers, grabbed our bags, we were the first ones to the customs, and I walked up to them and I said, look, we don't have our visas, but I have this official State Department letter that tells exactly why we're here and what we're doing. And he looked at me and he said, I can't accept that letter. I need $20 for your 10-day visa. I was like, oh, that's easy. Handed over $20. 
headed to a bus. We were the first ones on the bus, and we thought we were fine. We thought the bus doors would close. There was another bus behind us that would pick everyone else up, and we would make it to the parking lot on our own. But the bus waited. And the bus started to fill up with what we termed in the military as military-aged males. Males from the age of 18 to 32 who could employ or learn to use a weapon. So we got a little nervous. I started backing myself into a corner so that I could make sure I had eyes on everywhere and that my cohort, Robin, was very close to me just in case anything happened. <laughs> And then a family of four got on the bus. A wife and a husband and two small children. And in getting on the bus and negotiating their luggage and trying to keep the two children in check, they were having a considerable amount of trouble. And so my Robin started to entertain the two young children. And I helped them steady their bags. And out of a busload of individuals who could not speak English, the mother looked at us and in broken English said, thank you. And that's when I knew this was gonna be a different sort of trip. <clears throat> we were given a theater in Iraq, much like this one, where we were tasked with teaching 30 Iraqi young people, ages 16 to 24, how to choreograph their own dance. 16 of, them, the, 16 of the students were from Kirkuk. If you know Kirkuk, it's a very dangerous place. Um, Car bombs, IEDs, improvised explosive devices are set off almost every couple of days. And Erbil, you'll know of Erbil because it's right in the middle of Kirkuk and Mosul, two of the places that are now unfortunately uh, in control of, or if you just read the news recently, that ISIS has moved out of. We took this group of young people and we choreographed a 10 minute dance piece. Then we sat down with them and we started to talk to them. And we asked them, if you were gonna tell the world something, if you were gonna tell the world something through this dance, what would you wanna tell them? So as you watch this dance, I want you to think about what they said. That they wanted you to know that they're not much unlike you and I. They just wanna be able to grow up, fall in love, find a job that they enjoy, and be able to walk down the street without fear of danger. So I give to you a piece that we call Yarjun that was created in Iraq with these young people. Yarjun means they hope.
So the question is, where do we go from here? We like to end our performances with a spark of hope. I think during this journey, one of the things I've learned is that it's important to give all of this to the younger generation and to encourage them to take all of it and make something good. You're about to see an example of that. We encouraged one of our students to start a piece of choreography by herself. She selected the music, she selected the poem, and she led all of the other dancers in rehearsals for this next work. And I think one of the things that this next work that you're going to see says to me is one, that I think our hands are, that we are blessed to have this next generation. And two, they are full of such wonderful things that they can give back to us. The choreographer of this piece is Rachel Fiedler. She's also a student at the Greater Hartford Academy for the Arts. I hope that you'll take from this work why not only I have chosen to come back to dance, but why dance is important to us all. I hope you enjoy. Possible. So I give up. Sometimes people ask me, why do you dance? And I give them some pleasantry like, well, because it makes me happy. But I never actually tell them. I was a pretty lucky kid. The only real problems I ever had were the ones that happened around me, flying past me or through me, never really getting any bigger than the eye of my telescope. I washed the pain from closed doors. I hid beneath pillows and earphones to get away from anger. I covered my sadness in tears and made my purpose in life to fix everybody else's problems. I was always just the one in the middle. The only problem with that is my sadness and anger didn't count. There were always bigger things to handle than my silly little insecurities and anxieties, but these things tend to grow. And mine grew like a forest fire, taking over parts of me I thought I needed. Fear was a normal, everyday occurrence, and beauty was a word that I could never understand. So laughter covered the nervous twitches and makeup created some beautiful lies. These things I told myself were necessary just pushed me down farther. And I kept telling myself I was ugly and stupid just so I could cry empty tears and hear every brittle sound as it splashed to the ground with more confidence than I could ever seem to muster. So now when people ask me, why do you dance? This is what I never had the courage to tell them. Dancing is where I learned that beauty isn't simple or complicated. When I dance, life doesn't have to make sense. I can just be moving. The music runs through my veins like ice and fire, repairing all the misplaced words and overthinking, turning them to steam, rising off my body like moving pictures, and I feel so wonderfully alive. Now ask me one more time, why do you dance? Simple. I dance to feel beautiful and talented. I dance to tell my story in a way I can't speak. I dance because my body knows more about my pain and my triumph than I ever will. I dance because there's a place I can escape from everybody else's problems and find my own. I dance because it makes me happy. I dance because it makes me great. I dance because it makes me who I am.
I'd just like to ask all of the dancers to come out. Quicker than that. 